I think John actually put it succinctly and he said, because they get to drink twice as much. <laughs> so, you know, and session beer is different for everybody. I mean, myself, I like to consider six percenters session beers. My wife would disagree. <laughs> No. Okay, so what is a session beer? GABF guidelines state session beers are the color, the classic beer style being made to lower strength. Uh, appearance may vary from brilliant to hazy to cloudy with style of beer being made to lower strength. You see a pattern here. Aroma depends on the style of beer being made to lower strength. <laughs> Any style of beer can be made to lower in strength than described in the classic style guidelines. The goal should be to reach balance between the style's character and the lower alcohol content. Drinkability is a character in the overall balance of these beers. Beers in the category must not exceed 5% ABV. So, we're gonna kinda hold to that guideline, 5% or lower. Uh, there are some styles out there that, you know, maybe a little, little bit higher, but overall, for our intensive purposes, a session beer is anything less than 5%. But there's a couple things that they make in this statement that I think are, is, is, needs to be noted. Any style can be made to a session beer. So it doesn't matter whether it's a stout, uh, Belgian triple, whatever. You can make it into a session beer. Balance, in doing so, is critical. Um, with session beers, there's a lot less to the beer, body-wise, flavor-wise. Um, so the trick is to increase flavor, keep the balance, Keep it true to the style that you're trying to replicate. Just lower the alcohol. Um, quality. Quality is also key. So there's a lot less to hide behind, right? Uh, and quality kind of comes back to the sensory experience, bitterness, aroma, body, mouthfeel, uh, and personal preference. You know, some people are going to like something that's really hoppy. Other people are going to like something that's more malty. Some people are going to like something that's more balanced. But the idea is that. It increases the drinkability, meaning you can have several without going, all right, I'm fatigued already, I'm hammered, you know, I, I can keep going and I can carry on a conversation. So some classic styles, um, you don't have to take a, a Russian Imperial and try to make it into a session on your first session here. Uh, there's plenty of styles. Uh, John had a mile, which is a perfect example of a session beer. Uh, best bitters, ordinary bitters, uh, special bitters from English are a little borderline with a little higher than, you know, 4.8, 5.8%. Dry Irish Stouts, uh, Irish Reds, you've got Scottish Ale, 60, 70, and even 80s. Uh, Tapa beer from Belgium, right? Uh, table beer, Saison's, a lot of people think Saison's are 7%, mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily true, you can make them 5% or even lower. Uh, whip beer, blondes and pails, uh, strength, Germany. Uh, Mike said he was just in Germany. They have a lot of session beers because they drink a lot of beer, but they don't necessarily want to get hammered all the time. So a lot of their beers are very low ABV uh, or moderate. You know. uh, Pilsners, Nicalis, Gosa, Sports Beer, Kolsch, Alt Beer. I mean, they got a really long list. So, if you want to brew something, you've got plenty of classic styles. Basics. Uh, again, we'll just cover this really quick. Clean. You have to clean everything. That's part of being a brewer. If it's not clean, your beer is not going to turn out well. Uh, sanitize. Everything that comes in contact with beer post boil should be sanitized. Uh, minimize oxygen exposure, post fermentation, and pitch the correct amount of yeast. You do all those things you're going to have a remarkable amount of success in brewing whatever it is you want to make. Uh, recipe formulation. Look to classic examples. You know, to, to get a good start on where what it takes to brew a good low ABV style beer. Um, begin with the end in mind. What do you want your beer to be? Do you want it to be salty, hoppy? You know, what kind of yeast flavor do you want? Do you want something a little more estery, like English, or do you want? or phenolic or clovey, like uh, Saison or Belgian. Or do you want, you know, malty, the German lager yeast? Again, ale or lager. And then, you know, your specialty ingredients. Yeah, just because it's low ABV doesn't mean that you can't add fruit, spices, and dry hop. Do whatever you want with it. But keep in mind, 
there is less to hide behind. So you're not going to have as much of that body as, say, in a 7% beer. There's not going to be as much alcohol. And al alcohol does change the flavor of your beer. So realize your restraint. Sometimes less is more. Um, hop utilization is going to be higher. The lower the ABV goes, the higher your hop utilization is going to be. Uh, I did a like a 4% pail, and I knew, and I kind of held back a little bit on the bitterness, it still came out a little bit too bitter for what I was wanting. So next time I would scale it back even further. Uh, water profile has a big impact. Um, has anybody read the water book, Water Chemistry? Okay, uh, it's, it's a big part of it. Um, it can really change, it can improve or kind of drag your beer down. Specialty malts have a bigger impact on flavor. Maybe rein those in a little bit. Uh, added specialty ingredients can have a bigger impact on flavor. Your spices, you know, fruit. Bonus, decreased amount of materials used decreases your overall cost of production. So, not only do you get to drink more, but it costs less to do. <laughs> uh, so, some tips on grain selection, base malt. Base malt is pretty important. You can use a typical two row, but why limit yourself? I mean, you can use Bear's Otter. You can use even a two row pail that's about three and a half. I love Rar's pale malt. It adds a really nice base flavor to it. That's not your typical two row. Uh, you know, um, to the style, Belgian or English or German base malts have a lot of flavor that American two row just doesn't have. Uh, adding flavor, you know, layer your crystal malts a little bit. You know, maybe add just a little bit of a higher crystal malt along with your lower crystal malt. Add a little more flavor that you don't get from the, the lower color. Use Munich. Me, me or melanoidin malts to add a nice maltier backbone. And uh, let's see, you know, Maris Otter, Golden Promise, Sienna, Munich, all those are good. Adding color, you can add uh, debittered or hustless malts for uh, adding a little bit of color or making it nice and dark uh, with uh, minimal flavor impact. Uh, a tip on using black malt is add it to the top of your mash after you've mashed in and then and before sparging. I think, um, uh, what's that name? Gordon. Gordon? Um, yeah. Yeah, that mentions the same thing. He's like, just throw it in your last five, ten minutes of your mash. And, so you get plenty of color, but you reduce some of those harsh, uh, astringent flavors. Uh, mash pH. Mash pH is really important. Um, with a smaller grain bill, that uh, if you sparge, you know, your, your pH is going to rise a lot faster than if you had a larger grain bill. Um, so maybe acidify your, your sparge or use acid malt to help kind of modulate your, your mash pH a little, little closer. Um, body, actually, yeah, I put up there use of dextrin malts can add body, but I just read an article on that that kind of says, nah, that's not really true because if you're doing all grain, the enzymes are still chewing up those dextrin malts. So they're still breaking down their sugars. Uh, that was kind of new to me as well. But, on the other hand, you can add things that add maybe a little more protein, beta glucans uh, specifically, such as flaked oats, flaked barley, uh, rye. Rye is really good. Anybody use too much rye and stick their mouth? Okay. So that, all those proteins can add uh, viscosity to your beer, which ends up in the final beer, which kind of gives it a nice fuller feel to it. Uh, water. Uh, I recommend using a water tool. Brewing water is my favorite. I love that tool. It's great. Uh, I won't go into that because we can talk about that for days. Um, start with good water. At a minimum, use carbon filtered water. Uh, get those chlorines, chloramines, anything in there that you don't want. Uh, but you should also know your water file. Uh, water profile and adjust accordingly. You can get it from Tucson Water or send it off to Ward Labs for a report. I start with RO Water and build my profile back to the style. Um, and that becomes fairly important with uh, session beers. Again, you have less um, less to start with, 
So you can add, say, like calcium chloride, maybe a little bit more to increase a, a, a fuller mouthfeel. Uh, add acid to uh, acid malt to the mash, control mash pH. I, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, we used to use uh, phosphoric acid. Once we started using um, acid malt, pH settled right down, stays put every single time. Uh, acidify sparge water if you're you know, using lactic acid if you're sparging. You can do a no sparge. Uh, chloride to sulfate ratios can make a perceived difference uh, between malty or full and dry mineral. So be aware of what you're doing with those. Hops. Utilization will be higher the lower ground you beer. Uh, so balance. Balance is really important. Um, I just had a awesome uh, session IPA from Breakside called Lunch Break. Anybody ever had it? Phenomenally good, hoppy, extremely well balanced beer. Loved it. That was perfect. Um, if you're following a classic style, you know, refer to the IBUs. That's a tr tried and true uh, representation of that style. And there's a reason why those styles have stayed classic for so long. Bittering, flavoring, and aroma should complement and complete, not overpower. Um, and you know, you want to develop quality hot character, not you don't want something overly harsh. You, know, you don't want a harsh bitterness, you want a nice, smooth bitterness. And there's a whole bunch of science on that, and there's conflicting stuff coming out all the time, so I'm not gonna go into too much on that. Process, mashing, mash temperatures. Generally, you go a little higher. Uh, unless you're doing a, a nice, light, dry, like Berliner Weiss, uh, but if you want a, a nice pale ale, you know, and you want to increase the body a little bit, mash a little higher. Go 155 or even up to 158. Uh, it's not gonna hurt. Mash thickness should run on the thinner side, so it's the be nature of beta amylase, which will add more residual sugars to your beer and add more body. Uh, consider batch parts or no parts methods to avoid extracts with cans. Boiling, longer boil times can lead to the formation of melanoidins or caramelization, adding to flavor and body. Anybody ever done a uh, Scottish ale and actually boiled it down? Huge difference. Uh, it's a pain in the ass, but it's, <laughs> the results are, are really, really nice, and you don't get the same result from just throwing in a bunch of crystal ball. <coughs> Fermentation and yeast, accurate temperature control is important uh, to produce clean beers, especially if you're doing lagers. Uh, temperature control is really important. That's for rest, also important. And the yeast should fit the style of your beer or fit your flavor expectations, such as a Belgian IPA. You know, if you want an IPA, great. Don't do the Belgian yeast. If you want a Belgian IPA, throw a Belgian yeast. Uh, lower attenuate, attenuating yeast could also provide more body. So keep that in mind. Some of the English yeast are maybe not quite so atten attenuated and can uh, you know, leave your body here, body a little more full. Uh, a couple of recipes. I'm not going to touch on this for too long, but this is Firestone Walker's Extra Pale Ale. Uh, they do stem mash, but their malt mill is pretty simple 80% zero, 14% unit. 6% care pills. But they, they use hops judiciously, but at the right times. You know, bring flavor, nice balance, use English lemon ale yeast, add a little more flavor, dry hop, hold for three or four days, crash, carbonate. You're good to go. Do I have a date for you? Yeah, so Matt Reynoldson likes to do that biotransformation of hops. Has anybody heard about that? So you hop like towards the end of fermentation. I don't advise doing it in the middle of vigorous fermentation unless you like having your beer spraying all over the place, which is really bad coming out of a 30 barrel for me. <laughs> um, but the yeast will actually, the active fermentation of the yeast will actually, they will metabolize some of the hot compounds, the hot oils, and actually transform them into other flavors. So it will change it. It's a seven day beer. Yeah. 
So that's the other good thing about session beers. Beginning to end is pretty quick. I mean, you should get to drink it. And while you're drinking that one faster, you start the next <laughs> one. Um, so the, the girl that wrote uh, session beers, um, this book right here, Jennifer Talley, she worked for Squatters. Squatters is a group up, up in Utah where all their draft beer has to be 4% or less. So she got very good at making session beer. Here is her full suspension pale ale. Um, again, you know, starts out at 1042, finishes at 1011. IBUs, 3842. Pretty well balanced for that kind of, of beer. Uh, boil, 80 minutes. So a little longer than your standard boil. Malt, 66% two row, 10% Munich. 11% dextrin, a little bit of C40, and a little bit of C80. All Columbus hops, uh, five hops, or hops, I won't go into that, but at 70, 45, two, I'm not sure why two, <laughs> and dry hop. Uh, she uses uh, English cheese, and this is a kind of a recurring theme I've seen in a lot of recipes, even on IPAs and pails, using an English yeast can just give you that extra little bit of flavor. And that's what session beer is all about. Getting the flavor, just reducing the strength. Uh, fermentation, 68 degrees, so complete. Dried up for three or four days, crash 32. One. What do you think that 58 degree dry hops does? Um, I think just certain temperatures, um, I don't necessarily think you have to dry hop to get a nice hop flavor or hop aroma at 68 degrees. I think you can crash it to a much cooler temperature. I think reducing it to 58, she gets all her yeast out. Um, dry hops it still gets that uh, the, the hop aroma, and she's good to go. Um, some books, Fashion Beers. Uh, it's a good book, it's easy to read, it goes through pretty quick. Um, Oh, Brewing Classic Styles, Jamil Zanishev, very popular. Um, one of the first books I ever bought. Uh, Umami Factor, uh, kind of a different take on creating flavor in beer. It's a, it's a really interesting book. Uh, Radical Brewing, you like doing different things. Uh, designing Great Beers, Brew Like a Monk, if you're interested in Belgian farmhouse ales. And, you know, pretty much any of the style books out there are, are good. And then just some uh, website. I came across this one the other day. Uh, BarclayPerkins.blogspot.com, which is Ron Pattinson's blog. He's a lo written a lot of books on historical style. Uh, there's a blog up on his, on his blog that uh, talks about session and Russian Imperials. So the guy that likes doubts the Russian Imperials. Uh, it was kind of cool to go back and look at some of the styles and what the original gravities used to be like back in the 1940s. Uh, Mad Fermentation is an uh, excellent resource for brewing not just sour beers. Uh, Michael Tonsmar wrote the American Sour book. He does a lot of brewing and he posts a lot of what he, what his experiences are. There's a lot of really good information and techniques and what to do and what not to do. Uh, there's a, a link to several recipes for session beers on the uh, Home Brewer Association website. And then uh, on Facebook, Brewing Water, if you're not familiar with it, they have a, the, the guys that built the spreadsheet have a pretty good Facebook and put up a lot of pretty cool articles up there as well. Uh, and that's all I've got for you tonight on session beers. Any questions? Is it available for us to download? Yeah, so they have a free copy and then they actually have a, uh, if you want to donate to their cause, uh, they actually have a, you know, a, a more advanced version, and it's usually directed more towards commercial brewers. But if you wanted to donate twenty bucks or whatever, that you could get that as well. It's uh, I haven't got that. I haven't used it. The, the free one is very good though. Mike. So in the, on the first slide, you mentioned about uh, not oxygenating after boil. So the question is, doing a session. No, 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 no. I meant 
Sorry, I meant after fermentation. Okay. No oxygen after fermentation. Got it. All right, here you go. Yeah, that's, that's the same thing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's more yeast. Choke that yeast down. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Hey, Sean, if you were yeah. scaling back like a, a regular strength IPA recipe, would you keep that like gravity to IBU ratio the same on a session IPA? Yeah, kind of. I would probably scale it back a little bit more. Maybe uh, you could use like Dragoon IPA's current recipe. Talk about that a little bit. What can you scale that to? Sure, sure. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Well, we use two row, uh, C15, uh, and C60. And then uh, basically Magnum. Nugget, Columbus, Summit, and Apollo hops in copious amounts. And so I would, yeah, I would just kind of like cut out some of that two row. I would, you know, we don't use a ton of the, the crystal malt, so I probably wouldn't drop too much of that. But I would definitely scale back on the hops because if I, if I left those, even if I said, all right, well, I'm going to you know, scale it down to a five gallon batch, if I didn't knock those down even further, um, it would it would be too bitter. It would be really harsh. Um, it wouldn't be pleasant or drinkable. I mean, you could probably still drink it, but it, it wouldn't be. You know, well, I'm gonna drink it anyway. Um, so just realize that, again, you're gonna get more hop utilization. The lower the strength, the more utilization you get. Um, so it's it, and it becomes a balancing act. Did that kind of answer? Yeah. yeah, I was really just trying to get Dragoon's IPA recipe. Oh, <laughs> uh, now, now you know. There you go. Yeah, sort of. For a 30 barrel, yeah. Yeah, for a 15 barrel batch. Yeah, yeah. no problem. It's about, it's about, about a thousand pounds, so you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks, folks. I, I enjoyed it.